and welcome to Somerville Neighborhood News. I'm Tressa Sloan. And I'm Dan Richards. Today is December 10th. Somerville Neighborhood News is a community service production of SCAT TV, put together by staff, interns, and your neighbors. We bring you the news every two weeks right here on Channel 3 and on our website, scatvsomerville.org, where you can watch the news in your language. That's right. With just a few clicks, you can see this newscast with subtitles. Tonight, our reporters bring you stories on the rise of heroin use in Somerville, on the Brick Bottom Open Studios, on sports and the pep rally at Somerville High, and on plans for development in Union Square. But first, let's look at the big news from the past two weeks. Somerville scored. Partners Healthcare decided to consolidate many of their offices in Assembly Square. They'll be taking the spot that was going to be occupied by IKEA. That's right. Over 4,000 employees will be working from the new Partners Headquarters, and the company will be making a contribution to the city in lieu of taxes. In the November 26th broadcast, we covered this issue. If you missed the show, you can find it on our website. Police are asking everyone to be on the lookout for this man, who they suspect robbed the Santander Bank in Davis Square on December 5th. Kudos to the Somerville Patch for circulating the photo so quickly. That same day, hundreds of kids were already on the lookout, but not for a robber, for Santa. He stopped by City Hall to turn on the lights for the Christmas tree and the menorah. On a more somber note, our first story is about a drug on the streets that is growing in popularity and that is taking its toll here in Somerville. Heroin is something you tend to think happens to people you don't know and in neighborhoods that are far away, but not anymore. Reporter Kami Wood has the story. You can see it's actually moving, so it's like a liquid form. Heroin. It's the drug Somerville police are particularly concerned about this year. We have found that there are more heroin users today than in the past. A heroin at one time was uh, what was considered a junkie's uh, drug. You know, people used cocaine uh, for recreational purposes. We saw a lot of cocaine, a lot of marijuana. Today, we don't see cocaine as much because, again, cocaine is a recreational drug, but we are seeing a lot of heroin because heroin is so addictive. More and more people become addicted to it. They need it. The more they need it, the more it becomes accessible, and we're seeing more heroin today than we've ever seen in the past. Police say the heroin is purer and cheaper today than in the past. But one reason in particular makes it especially popular. The main reason is the availability. Um, you know, with, with the Oxycontin problem we've had in the past, uh, they've made you know, procedures now that you can't really get Oxycontin as easily as you could in the past. So people who have an Oxycontin problem, um, you know, a Percocet problem, have gone to heroin because it's more accessible, it's cheaper, you know, you don't have to go to a pharmacy to try to get it. Um, even on the street, it's not available like it once was. So heroin, unfortunately today, is much easier to get. Police say the heroin on the streets is stronger than ever, too. They find former addicts dead of overdoses in fast food restaurant bathrooms and parked cars. But then when you turn around and sold this off the street, you could, you could actually profit almost $400,000 just on this here. Wow. The heroin comes from Afghanistan. Distribution is like any other business. This dealer even has a logo and a brand, Knockout. So they made it a, you know, a law saying that you can possess hypodermic needles now. So we're seeing these everywhere, even in, on the, in the gutters, on sidewalks. We get calls all the time for pick up hypodermic needles. The heroin problem now has gotten so worse and it's affected even the best of families. You know, uh, years ago, there used to be that stereotype that uh, heroin was uh, people on the street, you know, junkies. That's not the case today. One Somerville resident who has been clean for six years agreed to share his story. He asked to remain anonymous, so his voice has been disguised. Um, things started to progress after graduation of high school. Um, and it progressed really quickly. I, I got a job on my college campus as uh, a bartender. and. You know, bartending led to um, to marijuana. Marijuana led to pills, and the social acceptability of all of the the common street drugs that we might hear about uh, really gave way to 
um, a more open mind to other substances that might help me chase the feeling away that, that I had that I just didn't belong in this world. He graduated at the top of his high school class and came from an apparently normal family. You know, if you looked at my life from the outside, um, prior to heroin becoming a part of it, it looked like I should have been living the American dream with the college graduation, top of the high school class. Um, but at the lows, it, it really got ugly. Um, you know, my mother and father found me overdosed in my bedroom. Um, my brother is still scarred to this day from that experience. Um, and, and it was that experience that led me to a detox unit, that led me to back to 12-step fellowships um, and into the meetings that I attend today. Now police say heroin dealers are moving off the streets and into homes. We've seen that the street corner dealing pretty much in Somerville has subsided. We don't see that often. Uh, because of the discreetness, we see a lot of narcotics use uh, coming from residents, coming from houses. And narcotics dealers are now trying to get into residential neighborhoods where they won't be detected. You know, they'll blend in with, with their neighbors. Um, unfortunately for, for them, that uh, you know, we get a lot of good information from people who reside in neighborhoods, they want to protect their neighborhoods, and tell us about oncoming traffic and what's going on in the neighborhoods. So it's, it's been very helpful to us. Almost every week, police are making heroin arrests here in Somerville. Police are working with prevention programs to ensure that users get help. If someone you know is an addict, there are many resources here in the city. Reporting for Somerville Neighborhood News, I'm Kami Wood. The man who shared his story wanted our viewers to know they can find information and help at www.nerna.org. Here are some additional resources. Somerville Cares About Prevention, the Somerville Trauma Response Network, and CASPAR. Next, the first two of five news stories done by Somerville High School students. Yes, this first one is from a group of students who took a look at the preparations for the pep rally and the Thanksgiving Day football game between Somerville and Cambridge. Hi, I'm Eliana Opetasano with the Somerville Neighborhood News and we're going to take an inside look at the Thanksgiving pep rally preparation. The pep rally is an annual tradition. Um, the coaches receive information actually back in July um, about a timeline to provide information for the pep rally. So the coach is doing long-winded speeches about each team, um, each fall team. What I do is I make a little booklet. Um, so at the end of this week, actually, their write-ups are due. Um, and just cut and paste their words into a booklet. I personally like the, um, the games that they play, the house games, uh, the pie-eating contests, the three-legged race, and the wheelbarrow races. Those are fun. Let's see how the football team prepares for pep rally in the Thanksgiving game. We have way more different workouts. We have some new coaches. I'm working a lot harder. Well, the team has been working really hard for the Thanksgiving game. It's probably, other, other than the, in the playoff game, this is probably the most important game of the year. game of the season, so I've been working really hard to end the season strong. The cheerleaders have been working just as hard. Let's see how sophomore Laleska Santos has been preparing. Sophomore Laleska Santos. You like always go out on the mat not knowing if it's going to hit or not, but you hope for the best. We get to express ourselves a lot on the mat. Like after a long day, if you're upset, you get to like take it out there and you get to spend time with people who become your family. We fix our routine to make it harder for regionals, so I'm pretty sure like you're going to see some of the same stuff and mixed in with different things. And a special shout out to these champion cheerleaders, 
and Eastern Mass champion, really the best soccer team, not just in Massachusetts, but in the region, the Summerwell High School Highlander boys soccer team. Great job. I guess all went well for the faculty and athletes at Somerville High. I'm Eliano Pedisano, youth reporter for Somerville Neighborhood News. Unfortunately, Somerville lost to Cambridge 7-41, but the school spirit couldn't be beat. Some other students put together a rundown of how the Somerville High School teams did this fall. The fall sports season has been full of excitement for athletes and fans at Somerville High School. The golf season gained a spark from Justin Carey's hole-in-one. Girls soccer finished 4-9-3, and, and senior captain Rachel Barry had a hat-trick against Everett in girls soccer. Girls cross-country finished 1-3, and three, while the boys finished 3-1. Alice Egar and Paula Guedes were GBL Invitational All-Stars in cross-country. The cheerleading team won the GBL championship and also participated in cheering on the walkers during the walk for breast cancer awareness. Great job, girls! The volleyball team made it to the playoffs and tied for second in the GBL with a 7-14 record. The Boston Latin knocked them out in the first round. Leslie Duarte received all-tournament at the GBL Cup. The football team, with a current record of 3-8, made it to the playoffs but were knocked out in the first round by top-seeded Tuxbury. Quarterback Phoenix Fuertes was named Player of the Week on October 31st by the Boston Globe. Boys soccer became Eastern Mass champions and remained champions of the North and the GBL before they lost a heartbreaker in the state final to West Springfield High in a penalty shootout. Coach George Scarpelli received a nomination for the Massachusetts Soccer Coaches Hall of Fame, became an Eastern Mass All-Star coach, and won Boston Globe Coach of the Year. Tyrone Miranda and Francisco Fernandez were Eastern Mass All-Stars in Boston Globe All-Scholastics. Miranda was also selected onto the East Coast All-American team and nominated as an NSCA All-American. To top it all off, Miranda appeared on SportsCenter's Top 10 for a sensational bicycle kick goal. He received the number four play on the Top 10. Congratulations to all our Fall Highlander athletes. Hello. Uh, at this week's journal, we'll have a lot of good stuff coming for you. We'll be looking at the latest developments at Assembly Square with Partners Healthcare set to come to the IKEA parcel. We'll be taking a look at the school committee evaluating Superintendent Tony Pirantazzi, and we'll also be looking at the library's participation in the Story Corps program. If you want to read more, you can always check out the paper. It comes out every Thursday and go online to wickedlocal.com slash Somerville. And if you have any tips or questions, you can give us a call at 617-629-3385 or email me at dadkinson at wickedlocal.com. Thanks. Every year, Brick Bottom artists open up their living and workspaces to the public. Peter Ballinon Rosen reports. Located in refurbished supermarket warehouses, Brick Bottom Studios provides a home and workspace for nearly 150 artists. Some of the art is decorative art, uh, some of it is fraught with meaning and politics and angst and um, some of it just makes you smile and um, all of it should make you think. Open Studios originally began years and years ago when artists that were not affiliated with galleries opened their studios to the public so the public could discover new artists. Some artists in the building look forward to this event because they uh, it's quite a uh, important part of their income, uh, whereas others, like myself, uh, do it more for a public service. The unique thing about our building is that it's residential as well as workspace. I know a lot of people like to see how people have decorated in their units. It's just a chance for the community to come and be inspired to get their creative juices flowing. Visitors saw all kinds of art from over 60 Brick Bottom members and sponsored artists. Some art was overtly political. Artists use the open studios as a way to connect with a new audience. I think I want to bring a new light. I mean, that light being um, making people aware of uh, that these exist and that the flight of the Indians is still very much um, on my mind and it should be on everyone's mind. This particular piece I'm very proud of. It's called Mission Accomplished with a question mark. Each pin in this map represents 
a soldier who died during Operation Iraqi Freedom. It's been placed in their hometown of record according to Department of Defense uh, casualty lists. This piece has received a lot of good uh, response. People think about it, or they're able to see stuff in context. The recession has squeezed some Somerville artists who don't always find a way to exhibit their work locally. A lot of the galleries that I used to show with are out of business now, so Open Studios is a great way for me to still have an audience. So having events like this gives people an opportunity to also see artists in their own space, which is a, a totally different experience than seeing it curated in a gallery. Open Studios gives artists and residents a chance to participate in the art scene here in Somerville. For Somerville Neighborhood News, this is Peter Ballinon Rosen. Brick Bottom is an example of how a neighborhood can be turned around. These days, another neighborhood is up for redevelopment, Union Square. For more than a decade, there have been meetings and reports and studies on the changes to come. Yes, but now things are really moving forward. With the Green Line extension to the square slated for 2017 and City Hall's announcement that it is looking for a single developer for the square, the looming changes appear closer than ever before. Somerville Neighborhood News Director Jane Regan takes a look, beginning with a meeting on November 18th at the Argenziano School. The meeting was a chance to hear from city officials and from the firm that will be designing Union Square's streetscape and making changes to the way traffic moves through the square and to the way that water and sewers run underneath it. We really want to make this a great place that people absolutely love. Well, some of the goals that we're going to be doing are increasing bikeability, walkability, uh, making Union Square completely accessible. Uh, reducing the reliance on the automobile, um, just making the streetscape better in every way. And right in the heart Rachel Burkhart from Parsons Brinkerhoff was also on hand. The firm was chosen for the $700,000 contract to do a new study and to prepare the first 25% of the new design. That plan will then go before the Mass Department of Transportation for approval. What we're going to be doing here is going over some of the previous studies. There's been a lot of processes associated with Union Square. Uh, some good ideas, some not so good ideas. It happens to be on, on a desire line, as we call it, uh, you know, which is basically the, the shortest way between two places. Burkhart and city officials asked people to give feedback and advice on little yellow stickies. I wrote down that I'd like to see a safer bike route on Prospect Street. Um, because whenever I bike to Union Square, I feel really unsafe. Most ideas concerned people's desire to preserve the square's historic buildings, open space, and to make biking and walking easier. Of this one uh, that just shows kind of what I like and what I would like to um, have maintained here in Union Square because I love the fact that there's open space and we have like a fluff festival and open farms work and all that stuff. And I really want to keep that. Concern about too many trucks and not enough room for bikers and pedestrians. These were a few of the issues raised by the people who attended the November 18th meeting at the Argenziano School. Reporting for Somerville Neighborhood News, I'm Jane Regan. We noticed that many local business owners weren't at the meeting, so we sent out a team to ask them what they would have said had they been there. In your point of view, what improvements can be made to the parking, biking, and traffic situation here in Union Square? Se podría mejorar más el parqueo. No hay suficiente parqueo para la gente. Un kiosco para traer música. La gente se interesa en venir a escuchar la música y y y después de la música venir a los negocios. No es solo un solo negocio. Sí, sí se puede poner más uh, luces para que los carros se paren y que la gente pueda cruzar. I believe the bicycles are very important right now for the city, but we have a little problem at Union Square. So once we don't have parking enough for customers, and they last summer they, they installed one hack bike just in front of my store. Uh, now we ha I have only two spots available, and one of them. Uh, I have a lady that from one store close to us, she, she has a, a, a handicap plate. She used the spot the whole day for her. 
now uh, all our customers from other restaurants here, they fight from the one, only one spot available. And they, this year they install again, it's still outside if you check. I ask them, please move the, the, the spark from the other side of the street once we have just one spot available here. This, I think, gonna help us here. What improvements would you like to see here in Union Square? One of the things that I wanted to mention is the, the uh, way that they designed the uh, parking in uh, Block 11 Cafe. It's caused traffic in there, so it's sideways. Um, I think it should be the other way around. And the other thing is that um, if the, um, you know, if the city can help us, uh, for example, the loading zone, you know, I own two restaurants here and I'm, I take more than 20 minutes to upload my products. And I always get ticket in here. And another thing is that uh, parking is really um, tough. It's, uh, it's not too many parking, the state, I mean, it's a parking area here, so it's good for my business and then good for my customer. So we have, I think it's uh, the parking space and then very cloudy here. So the kids, uh, when they, when the kids go to school, it's really traffic here, and, but nobody here, nobody control the traffic. So that is really problem. It's very important in Union Square, because there's no problem parking. Parking is a big problem. It's difficult to make a new place to make parking. It's very important. We need to be on the side for all the owners of Union Square, or at least for the people who work in Union Square, and make the machines, because we don't have that, especially when we don't park in the street. Union Square is beautiful. We know that. It's really beautiful. Il y a plus de gens qui viennent venir et surtout, je pense que y a un train qui besoin de faire arriver là. Ça veut dire que l'Union Square va avancer. C'est nous-mêmes qui pouvons avancer ensemble, les gens qui habitent dans la zone et surtout les gens qui ont besoin de la zone. Let's hope all the changes don't take away from the great diversity we have here in Union Square. To find out more about the plans, we invited Mimi Graney, Executive Director of Union Square Main Streets, into the studio. Hi Mimi, thanks a lot for coming down. Um, I know that you work with Union Square Main Streets and the reason I invited you is exactly to talk about Union Square. A lot of things are being talked about in the Boston Globe, WBUR, there are meetings all over the place as you saw we covered one recently about infrastructure. Can you help us navigate what's going on here and what, we, what changes are coming down the pike? Well, the big picture is we're trying to bring Union Square back to being a transit-oriented neighborhood. We grew up in this neighborhood, like the rest of Somerville, as a streetcar suburb. Mm. Um, Somerville Union Square at one stage had 108 trolleys stopping here each day. So the central business district grew up where you could walk around to the different stores. Mm -hmm. If you lived here in the neighborhood, you would be able to walk to all the houses nearby, walk and hop on the train to go to other neighborhoods or to your job. Mm -hmm. So with the brick coming of the Green Line, we're looking at returning back to that density um, and cleaning up a lot of the industrial um, and auto-related uses that have grown up here over the last couple decades. Hmm. So it's part of a big plan that's sometimes called the redevelopment plan. And well, that reminds me of another thing that's been in the media lately. It's this idea that City Hall has um, thrown out there saying that they want to go with a single developer for a bunch of spots around the square that they hope will either be uh, sold in a friendly manner or that they might take over by eminent domain. The Union Square revitalization plan that the city put forward identified a bunch of parcels uh, that are in need of particular transformation. Mm -hmm. So those areas are really centered around where this future Green Line stop is going to be under the bridge on Prospect Street. Uh -huh. So it looks at all these parcels along Somerville Avenue mm -hmm. where the scrap iron is and the radiator spot. What they sometimes call the civic block where the um, police and fire station is in Rickey's. A couple of the auto spots along Washington Street. Um, this stretch along Somerville Avenue where the motorcycle spot is, mm -hmm. and then the Citizens Bank and the parking lot. So those are all spots that um, really aren't living up to their potential, mm -hmm. um, that we could have a lot more housing, a lot more jobs. Um, so by gathering those together, that we can help meet some of those bigger goals that we've got. So that revitalization plan yeah. said we want to take these by, the, the city sort of threatening to take them by eminent domain. Mm -hmm. The hope initially was, uh, that folks would either develop them or sell to developers, but hoping that folks would kind of start working together. Mm -hmm. We're not necessarily seeing 
a lot of partnerships kind of organically happen. Mm -hmm. The city's now uh, put out a uh, request for qualifications for a master developer. Okay. And the goal would be that an, an one single developer would help coordinate all this. Now, folks in the community, the things I'm hearing are concerns around transparency, about neighborhood character, both in terms of the local independently owned businesses, mm -hmm. but also character of design. Um, folks are concerned about the, um, the lack of engagement with the process. Um, and folks, nobody really likes eminent domain. Um, <laughs> so some of those concerns are gonna be true whether we have a single developer or a master developer. Mm -hmm. um, so with the master developer, there's actually some advantages over lots of individual developers. Um, we're more likely by having a larger master developer that's going to help redevelop some of these areas that couldn't be developed individually. So for example, along Prospect Street, where we've got all these polluted areas, you can't clean up the individual spots. They really have to happen together. I see. And then we're also, if we're caring about sort of having affordability in open space, it doesn't make sense for each individual spot to try to have their own parking or even set up share parking, like where's the central parking garage going to be? I know we're not trying to emphasize cars, but recognizing there is going to need to be some parking in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, and to have it kind of coalesce. So for example, if we're wanting to have cultural uses or spots that are going to have lower um, rents if it's going to be a s smaller business or a locally owned business, we're going to need places that have higher rents to be able to help pay for some of the lower rent spots. Oh, so see. this helps balance that all out. Um, so there is going to be a community advisory committee that's going to inform the city um, in their selection of who they think is the most qualified um, candidate and will help um, craft that agreement with the developer. So this is sort of, uh, it's like we're courting and we're looking for a new partner mm -hmm. um, and we're helping to say like, this is our wish list of who we're looking for in a partner and helping to craft that agreement. And this is only the beginning of what's hopefully going to be a long and fruitful marriage. Um, and that it's going to be an ongoing dialogue. So each of the individual parcels as they develop under this master developer still have to go through the planning process and the zoning process and the design process. Um, and that will in, in some ways be able to um, collectively help support those values that we're looking to see manifested in the neighborhood. This committee, has it been chosen yet? Uh, is it self-selecting? And once it's set up, will there be a way that residents and business people can be influencing the committee and saying, hey, committee, I wish that you would put a little more, bit more emphasis here or there? There was a call for people to um, nominate themselves or be nominated for this committee. Mm -hmm. um, the, that list is being finalized and is going to become public shortly. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not quite sure what the whole process is going to be yet of how that committee is going to work. That that hasn't sort of the process hasn't begun, but I'm sure that it's my understanding that, that committee is a pretty broad uh, selection of stakeholders, okay. and I can imagine that those folks are going to be people that are already known and that are going to be open to hearing what um, community issues are. Thanks a lot for coming down and sharing the information that you have. As you know, uh, SCAD is right here in Union Square. So whatever role we can play um, by at least uh, hosting programs um, that talk about this or hosting meetings, I'm sure we want to be part of the process. This is an issue we will continue to follow. We hope the people and businesses in our neighborhood are kept up to speed by city officials. And that wraps up our broadcast. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back on December 24th. Remember that you can watch Somerville Neighborhood News anytime on our website, where you can view the news with subtitles in 44 different languages. If you want to get involved, or if you have any story ideas, drop us a line at news at scattvsomerville.org.